you want me to do it? Just no. yeah. All right, so this morning I'm going to need you to have your Liturgy of the Hours book open to Sunday, week one, the first psalm, which is Psalm 63. <clears throat> All right? Sunday, week one, first psalm is Psalm 63. And my advice would be, my rec recommendation would be that during the entire conference uh, that you have that open for yourself. <clears throat> I didn't say what page. Just, I think you can find that. Sunday week one, morning prayer. The first psalm is Psalm 63. Do we have it? Do we have it? In the four volume and six eight eight. I think you're the only brilliant one with the four volume here. Deacon Deacon Bob. All right, are we settled? Yes. This is not giving a good impression to the world about oil and me, is it? You're being recorded right now, folks. <laughs> What did you say? Live stream. Live stream. That's right. Excuse me. Uh, where's Rose? Is, is this is this going, Rose? When I when I start the prayer. Um, just by way of a little bit of background. This is a little too loud, isn't it? Just by way of a little bit of background. If you remember, in uh, October. No, it was our November meeting, our November combined meeting. And we had a guest speaker, didn't we? Supposed to have a guest speaker. Yes. And within, with about two days notice, if it was even that much, I became the guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just sharing this week with you because God really, I think sometimes he has a, something wrong with his sense of humor. Yeah. So for... For the December meeting, I was planning, you would be happy to know this, Bob, to speak to you. I know you can't see it too well from where you're sitting, but if you were here for October meeting, you remember that Bob brought up Carlo, is it Acutis, uh, who died at the age of 15. And his story is remarkable, but I had a hard time getting enough information to make it a conference. I finally got a really good source. So, but anyway, that was my plan. And I struggled and struggled, and finally I had to give up on that. And uh, about a week before the October meeting, I came across this wonderful source of material, but it was too late. So in October, uh, we spoke about um, um, the Apostle of the Eucharist, Peter Julian Amar. And for December, I was going to speak about Carlos, but just quit. Too late. So I thought, okay, God, you must have a plan. <laughs> I need to know it right away. And it was nothing that I was thinking about. So without any further ado, we're going to begin this uh, reflection today with Psalm 63 as the first part of the conference or reflection. So let's begin with praying that psalm together. And think about this when you're praying it. What does this have to do with Christmas? What does this psalm have to do with Advent? You might be just as surprised as I was when the Holy Spirit said, let's start with Psalm 63. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 O oh God, you are my God, for you I long. For you, my soul is thirsting. 
my body pines for you, like a dry, weary land without water. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. For your love is better than life. My lips will speak your praise. So I will bless you all my life. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul shall be filled as with a banquet. My mouth shall praise you with joy. On my bed, I remember you. On you, I muse through the night. For you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings, I rejoice. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We pray that psalm on the first Sunday morning, first Sunday of the week one, Sunday morning prayer, every week one of Sunday morning prayer. We also pray it on all solemnities, sometimes on feasts. So it's a very familiar psalm in a, way, in a certain way, isn't it? <clears throat> it's linked to the time that King David was in exile, far from the temple. Think about some of those words we just prayed. He's in exile, far from the temple, far from worship in the temple. Think about 20th, 21st century, year 2020. Any comparison? Yes. We were in exile, weren't we? In a certain sense, many people regarding worship are still in exile. Exile from the Eucharist. Our worship of Jesus was in exile. A worship of Jesus in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Some churches were open all day because of that, so we could go for a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, but we could not go for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We could not go for Holy Communion. So let's compare the two exiles and our sentiments with King David's sentiments. He is in a desert this exile that he's in, the desert of the Arabian Peninsula. Sounds awful, doesn't it? He was also living in a spiritual desert. He was thirsting for God, like a land that was weary and without water, without worship, thirsting for the consecration of the host and the wine. Let's take Psalm 63 a bit further. Let's take it into the New Testament. Both Testaments, new and old, are the sacred word of God, aren't they? So there's a harmony between them. Certain way we could say they're singing back to one another and forth to one another. There's a unity there. There's an echo, one with the other. And this, for David, awakens in him a holy new awe for Yahweh. Think about yourself. 
during those several months when we could not go to Holy Mass? Did it awaken a hunger, a thirst, a yearning for Jesus in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, in Holy Communion? David said in his psalm, your love is better than life. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, beginning with the first chapter, verses 1 to 21, I'm going to refer to them a few times. He says, I have come to consider everything as loss. Parentheses, your love, said David, is better than life. How did you, what did you feel loss about? Consider everything is lost without the temple, without the temple worship. Because of the supreme good of knowing Christ, everything else doesn't matter. To be found in him, that I may be conformed to Jesus Christ. David says, my soul clings to you. Paul says, I want to be conformed to Jesus Christ. The goals, if we look at both of them very closely, of David and Paul are the same. The hungers are the same. First of all, we can see clearly that both men knew they were loved by Christ. And love was all. Love was everything. Both men knew that they were in love with Jesus Christ. Love for Christ, love for Yahweh, were the keys to the meaning of their lives, to everything. David, my soul clings to you. Paul, for me, life means Christ. Think of ourselves in that time. Was our hunger and thirst like that? Love was the key to their conversions. Day by day, conversion and whole entire life once they knew Christ, once he, even David, if he had been alive, imagine how he would have learned, longed for Christ. They longed to be seized by Christ and they were compelled by worship, both men. They were compelled by the Eucharist, Paul certainly was, and the apostles once they were given that great gift. Compelled by loving Jesus as he has loved us. Compelled to discover God in everything, both men. Discover God in everything. <clears throat> Paul again, Philippians chapter 3. I have come, think about ourselves now exiled from the Eucharist. All of the New Test of the Old Testament was yearning for the Savior. I have come, said Paul, to rate all as lost for the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I have forfeited everything what did you forfeit? What did we forfeit? To seize an opportunity to be at the Eucharist during that exile. I have forfeited everything so that Christ may be my wealth. So Paul's talking about forfeiting material things and spiritual. That Christ may be my wealth. 
I wish to know Christ and the power flowing from his resurrection. To know how to share in his sufferings. My goodness. That was one of the things for which he gave up everything. To know how to share in his sufferings. By being conformed to the pattern of his death. Now, we can become conformed sacramentally to the pattern of his death through the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Mass, and through Holy Communion. I am racing to grasp the prize, says Paul, since I have been grasped by Jesus. Wow, what a goal. Racing to grasp the prize, since I have been grasped by Jesus. Now this one makes me smile, almost laugh, but it's very serious. So Paul says to us, the whole Christian community is speaking to now, all of us who are spiritually matured, is that anybody here? Spiritually matured? Must have this same attitude. In other words, what, what we just quoted from Paul. He's saying, we all have to have that attitude. Not just me, Paul. We all have to. And David, what's he saying in the same way? I will bless you all my life. I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. That was his goal. My mouth shall praise you with joy. My soul clings to you, says David. You have been my help. Where was I? <laughs> that sentence there, let me go back to it. All of us who are spiritually mature must have Paul's attitude. I've surrendered everything that Christ Jesus may be my wealth. That's what he's talking about. I've surrendered everything so Jesus can be my everything, my greatest treasure. During these weeks of Advent and into the entire Christmas season, let's take all of the above, meditate on it deeply with the Gospels of these two seasons, with Psalm 63, and with Paul's letter to the Philippians. David, Psalm 63. I ask you to pray it over and over and over and over again. I wanted to give you a handout of it, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, but you know, you could write it down, which is what I ended up doing this morning. Just write it down and keep it nearby so that you, by the time the end Christmas season is over, it's memorized, if it isn't already. And pray it with Christmas thoughts in mind. The yearning that we hear from the prophets of the Old Testament. Imagine Joseph, St. Joseph, when he knew that Mary was with child and he didn't know how. The yearning in Joseph. His soul wasn't filled with a banquet, was it? But he was thirsting like the dry land without water for Yahweh to speak. Meditate contemplate, and these you want to write down, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, and the magi from these citations. Luke 1, verses 1 to 20. 
We know them so well that we might think we know it all. Far from it. The word is eternal, right? And the word contains at least a thousand secrets. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 23. Place yourself in the scenes. We can touch the emotions, the fear, the worry of Joseph, for example, if we put ourselves in that scene and the dilemma he was going to put her away quietly. That little, that little sentence says so much about what's happening in Joseph. Pray, I would suggest pray Paul's entire letter to the Philippians. But first, chapter one, verses 1 to 21, and chapter 3, verses 7 to 15. Visit and revisit these sacred scriptures all during both of these holy seasons. It's also, at least I find it also to be very fruitful to take, pray the readings from Mass, but I especially recommend those from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, which we've been hearing, I think, every day during the first week of Advent. When we connect those citations with Isaiah and the ones from the New Testament, they're so powerful. Preparing for Christmas, secondly, in the light of Jesus coming to our hearts in Holy Communion and the Holy Spirit coming to our hearts so powerfully in the sacrament of the forgiveness of sins. Every Holy Communion, if we think about it, has the substance of a Christmas invitation. And the invitation is, welcome Jesus into the inn of your soul. Think of those who close the doors on him and the people that are closing their doors on him today in the Eucharist. St. John Chrysostom, says this. As Christmas draws near, we prepare our best clothing. Isn't that true? And we could add, we do a lot of shopping and we do, right? All that stuff. It's all wonderful. It's part of what makes Christmas merry, isn't it? But he goes on, he says, as Christmas draws near, we prepare our best clothing days of, ahead of time while paying not the least attention to your soul. Now let me read the opening prayer for Mass tomorrow in light of that sentence. I'm going to repeat it. St. John Chrysostom, quote, as Christmas draws near, we prepare our best clothing days ahead of time while paying no, not the least attention to our souls. Right? Opening prayer. Come on. I can't believe myself today. Okay, this is for tomorrow morning's Mass. Almighty and merciful God, may no earthly undertaking, hear that? 
may no earthly undertaking hinder those who set out in haste to meet your son. But may our learning of heavenly wisdom gain us admittance into his company. And I repeat the beginning of that prayer. Isn't, I, isn't it like an echo of John Chrysostom? Almighty and merciful God, may no earthly undertaking hinder those who set out to hasten to meet your son. No earthly undertaking. Continuing with John Chrysostom. He says, he calls this no earthly undertaking and paying attention to our clothing, but nothing, nothing about our souls. John Chrysostom says, calls this a state of insensibility, spiritual numbness, mediocrity. This spiritual numbness and mediocrity increases its grip day by day if it is not addressed. So we need to, we need to be sensitive to it. What are we doing? Are we all wrapped up in getting the clothing or the gifts or the food prepared, which is all good, well and good, but no attention? to what it's all about. Whoever makes, John Chrysostom, whoever makes no preparation for receiving Jesus in the Eucharist, like the person who makes no preparations of a spiritual nature for Christmas, will inevitably fall into these pits of insensibility, spiritual mediocrity, and numbness. To go to Holy Communion occupied with other thoughts is a ref recipe for dropping one's spiritual temperature. Good analogy, isn't it? To be lukewarm, which is going to happen if our spiritual temperature drops, is to give no importance to the most holy sacrament we are receiving. Give no importance to it. It's a numbing thought, isn't it? To be re preparing for Christmas only on a material level. And there's so much on the material level, we could even become, as he's saying, numb to the fact, insensitive to the fact, that it's primarily a spiritual event, a spiritual day, a spiritual season. On the other hand, he says, the worthy reception of Holy Communion will always be an opportunity to set us on fire with love. No numbness. No insensitivity to prepare, to prepare for receiving Jesus in the Eucharist will always set us on fire with love. Not to prepare is to remove ourselves from the fire. Like Barbara, where's Barbara? Right over there. She came in this morning and told me why Joe's not here, because they have no heat in their house. We didn't have any heat when I came in this morning because there was a steak on the thermostat. Go home, turn all your thermostats down. What's gonna happen? We're all gonna be cold, aren't we? Hello there? Yes. yes. <laughs> We're all gonna be cold. The same idea, when we don't prepare for the incredible gift of the Eucharist, for, from which we were exiled, 
we are removing ourselves from the fire of his divine love. It's just another thing we do, kind of without thinking. Some remedies. <clears throat> Some things we can consider doing in preparation for the Holy Mass and Holy Communion. Avoid doing things at home before Holy Mass that can cause you to be distracted during the Holy Sacrifice of the Eucharist. Anything come to mind that you could avoid doing at home or even on your way to the Eucharist? that will help you not to be so distracted during Mass. The first thing I think of is all the technical equipment we have, right? We don't need the radio on before we go to Mass. God forbid we don't need the television on before we go to Mass. We don't need the radio on when we're in the car going to Holy Mass. Sacred time. Look what Jesus did before the first Eucharist. Look what he did. Anything I'm doing is comparing, comparable to it. Pray. Now, let me first ask this question. Is there anybody in this room that goes to an evening mass because that's all that's available to you? Twice a week in my parish, we have an evening mass. <clears throat> and some people can only go to an evening mass. So pray. So before we go to mass, if we're all going to mass in the morning, some of our OLME spiritual elements should be part of that preparation. And then if that's the case, we should be taking very special care to pray with reverence, to pray with attentiveness, so that they're preparing our souls for this incredible gift. This gift that we never want to be numb about, mediocre about, insensitive to. Pray with Mary, Joseph, the shepherds. How many of us were here when Monsignor Baker gave the talk about Christmas and the shepherds? Anybody remember? Mm -hmm. It was about he was here, and it was about I'd say maybe five, eight years ago. I don't know why you wouldn't remember. <laughs> but this one just astounded me so much. The message to the angels. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And the Father told us there were shepherds who were assigned to raise sheep to be offered for the sacrifice. In the temple. And that was the way they treated the lamb. And the lamb that was offered in the temple would become at eventually our Eucharist. So these, these assigned shepherds who raised these special sheep were to be without flaw, perfect, like Jesus. And so the key for the shepherds that night was wrapped in swaddling clothes. The swaddling clothes were to protect them from any kind of wound or harm. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Pray with Mary, who knew that, with Joseph, who knew that, 
with the shepherds who knew that immediately. They're going to find the Messiah, not just a baby. And the gospel tells us after the shepherds went out and told the wonderful thing that had happened. Wow. Strive to come to church early, not just on time. Now, what do I mean by early? Well, at least 10 minutes, at least. Why? Time for quiet. Time for readying myself for the banquet and the sacrifice and the Holy Communion. At least 10 minutes, maybe longer. These efforts and others that perhaps you're already doing help to ward off an invasion of distractions, especially when we receive Jesus. Wanting to receive him more and more with reverence and with devotion. Our Thanksgiving after Holy Communion will become more intense, more loving, and will keep us more united with Jesus through the rest of the day, not just for those 10 minutes when he's sacramentally present. I have a question that I'd like you to ask yourself. Do I need to get up earlier? Do I need to get up earlier? What matters? David says, I muse on you through the night. My soul is thirsting for you. Paul says, I have sacrificed everything for the sake of gaining Christ. Do I need to get up earlier? Because from the time we get up in the morning until we receive the closing blessing at Holy Mass, we're preparing everything. We're preparing. Now I want to talk about two Eucharistic virtues and also the sacrament of the forgiveness of sins. These two virtues, there are others, but I think these two are primary foundation stones. Humility and love. Love and humility. <clears throat> these two virtues need to clothe our souls like the swaddling clothes with essential dispositions for welcoming Jesus, for receiving him worthily in Holy Communion. They are primary for coming to the sacrament of the forgiveness of sins. I can't really confess my sins without them. Wouldn't you agree? I can't admit I'm a sinner without humility. Therefore, it can't be just a rote confession. It has to be prepared for, just like Holy Mass. Some essentials for growth in the dispositions that these virtues give us, the prayer, the spiritual dispositions that they give us. Humility and love. First, we must be faithful to the nightly examination of conscience. Not just the act of contrition, but an examination of conscience preceding the act of contrition that has truth in it. <coughs> 
No blaming of someone else. No excusing ourselves. Second, for these virtues to grow in us, is frequenting the sacrament of the forgiveness of sins, the sacrament of reconciliation. Third, contrition, but a contrition that shines through with the virtue of truth in capital letters. Again, it's not just a rote prayer without thought. The heartbeat of my act of contrition has to be humility <clears throat> and love. And those two virtues are clothed in the virtue of truth. There is no real sorrow without it. <clears throat> to prepare ourselves to receive Jesus in Holy Communion means first and foremost to receive him with no mortal sins. And if I think or I'm not sure that I may have committed a mortal sin, then when I am in the sacrament of confession, I have to bring that up. I'm not sure, but I have to get sure. Why? Because I want it taken away. I want to be filled with the light of truth. I want to be filled with humility and love. Also, it's important to consider if I am coming to confession, <clears throat> always repeating the same sins without a serious attempt, a serious attempt to surrender to conversion regarding habits of sin. Sin that I keep bringing back and I really am sorry and I'm so grateful for the forgiveness, but I don't have any plan to stop that sin. So next time I go to confession, there it is again. You have to have a plan. Makes me think of Father Benedict Rochelle. He had this wonderful advice that he so frequently gave out. What's the next, next best step? So that habit that I keep bringing back and back Father Benedict would be saying, now don't look at the whole landscape and what you're going to have to do to blah, 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 blah. What's the next best step? And after that step has been rooted, well then what's the next? So that we get rid of that. Because hab a habit of sin, sin that I keep committing, and I don't make any plan to really get rid of it except go back to confession again, is very self-centered. It means I don't love you, Jesus, enough to give it all up, step by step. And he's so loving, he doesn't say, now I just forgave it all with absolution, so stop it. No, he doesn't say that, really. All right, what are you gonna do next? And when that next gets fixed, what's the next step so that it's all gone? Now, can I fall into it again? Yes. But if I have gotten rid of it and then I find myself back in it again, humble and loving, back to confession and again, the next best step. We always want to approach the sacrament of the forgiveness of sin with a desire, a deep desire for purification with loving, holy awe. You know when people so casually say, oh, that's awesome. <gasps> it makes my, mm, I have to zipper my lips. <laughs> what is awe? Awe is for God. Find another word. 
all as a gift of the Holy Spirit, one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Loving all arises from reflection on what I consider an ocean of grace that we receive in the sacrament of the forgiveness of sin. It floods us in the most wonderful way. Think about it. Oh, I just love to think about it when the priest is ready to give us absolution. And I get, you know, I'm just, okay, I just can't wait now. And he raises his hand with the sign of the cross, which is the only reason my sins can be forgiven, isn't it? Because of the cross that Jesus bore. And listen, watch for that hand. Listen to the words with like, oh, they're your, your, they're your life support. They're, they're everything of David's Psalm 63, the words of absolution. When the priest raises his hand to bless us with that sign, it floods my soul, your soul, our souls with a new outpouring of sanctifying grace. There's actual grace of the moment. There's sanctifying grace that came to us first in baptism. And it doesn't go away unless we choose totally to, I don't want it anymore, God. What an awful thing. What are the, what are the gifts that we receive through sanctifying grace? In baptism, faith, hope, love, sanctifying grace. Every time we receive absolution, every time, a new outpouring of those baptismal graces, supernatural virtues. It also means a renewal of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are also supernatural gifts, and bring into us sanctifying grace, all brand new gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, all before the Lord. It used to be called fear of the Lord. All before the Lord. On the day of confession, <clears throat> the day you're going to confession, be very desirous of being mindful of it during the course of the day. Mindful of it with joy, gratitude, Mindful of it with sorrow, a holy sorrow for our sins. And then a few closing considerations. <clears throat> Fulfill your daily duties for all, all these things we've been talking about as well as you possibly can. Because when we do them as well as we possibly can, we are giving glory to God, especially when they are duties and responsibilities. Make amends to Jesus whenever you neglected an inspiration of grace during the day. Remember I just said there's sanctifying grace and there's actual grace. And the actual graces are those whispers from the Holy Spirit all day long. Don't do that. Do that for me. Stop speaking unkindly. Be patient with that person. They're actual graces. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Oh, good. I thought maybe we're already saints and I didn't hear about the canonization. <laughs> So make amends to Jesus 
every time you did not listen or embrace those actual graces. When you do embrace them, smile. Say, Jesus, I love you out loud if you can. Say, thank you, Jesus, if you can. Throughout the day, make frequent acts of spiritual communion. We used to hear a lot about that, but we don't hear it very much anymore. But they're wonderful little things. Jesus, since I cannot now receive you in the Eucharist, come to me spiritually. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Offer little prayers of praise and thanksgiving and love, like the one I just said a few minutes ago. When I embrace an actual grace, I actually do it. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Jesus, have mercy. When we do these things, whatever we do, little works like prayer, service, our jobs, our responsibilities in our families, little by little, these works, whatever we do, our hearts will be more and more centered on God more frequently through the day. And these little moments of placing ourselves in his presence, so to speak, will move us away from seeing everything through the prism of self. Move us away from seeing things from the prism of ourselves to seeing from the prism of the sacred word, the prism of the Eucharist, the prism of divine mercy, Sounds a lot nicer to me than the prism of self. To seeing things also from the prism of our OLME promise, of our spiritual elements, of our wonderful charism, to live the Eucharist in Mary's spirit of praise, sacrifice, and love. When a soul is pure, clean from these two sacraments, the person has within and without a spiritual, supernatural light. Like the light of the Christmas star, the light of the heavens that filled that were filled with the angel's song and presence. Christ is born again every time we embrace a grace. A little light goes on, maybe a big one. Amen. Amen. Doug? Sing on a silent light.
the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas.